Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of my past week or so in reading. The first book that I'm going to talk about was the last book that I read for March Mystery Madness, and that was Sajata Masi, The Widows of Malabar Hill. Depending on what market you're in, this might actually be titled The Murder on Malabar Hill. This is a story set in 1920s Bombay about a Parsi woman who is the only female solicitor in the city, and she works for her father's law firm, and he is the executor of a will of a man who has left behind three widows, and they are extremely religiously observant Muslims who won't deal with unrelated men. So since our main character happens to be the only female solicitor, she goes to see what's happening and thinks that there's fishiness going on, which eventually leads to a dead body and more mystery ensues. I was a little bit cynical about this going into it because I have seen short stories dealing with similar things in which there's almost a, a smugness to certain religions versus other religions. So I was cautious going into this because I was afraid this was going to fall into that. And it's interesting in that, that you're almost led to believe that that's going to happen. And there is actually at one point a character who says, well, you know, Parsis are the most enlightened culture in Asia. And then you get some backstory and it's like, well, not everybody's as enlightened as you think. And on the other side, not everybody is as oppressed or repressed as you think. And so I liked that element. So that element I thought was well done and didn't fall into things that I think historical fiction with certain trappings can fall into. In terms of the mystery itself, uh, the timing played out really nicely. I, I liked that it starts off with one mystery of is there something fishy going on about these women giving up their inheritance and then the actual murder happens later on. So this isn't the kind of whodunit where you have a murder right away and you just go forward from there. This gives us some highs and lows and as well there is a backstory about without saying too much, kind of a failed relationship that the main character has had. And that plays out not in alternate chapters, which I think worked fairly well, but uh, every few chapters you'll get a couple of extra chapters of the backstory. I wasn't 100% sold on the pacing. I think there was a little too much flashback, but overall I thought it was handled quite well. And I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what else happens in this series, because I definitely think there are a lot of ways to go with that. The one flaw that I would point out, aside from the pacing issue, is that the backstory plot ends in a scene that's set in the main timeline that is a little too convenient. And while it's a little bit open-ended and that they can play with that a couple of different ways, it, it really felt a little too pat and I wasn't a huge fan of the way that wrapped up. But other than that, I quite enjoyed this and enjoyed the character, so I look forward to seeing more from the series. Next up I read a memoir, which was Josh Sundquist's We Should Hang Out Sometime, Embarrassingly a True Story, which is basically a recounting of his romantic history, which is a little awkward. Josh Sundquist is a YouTuber, among other things. I originally heard of him because I saw his one-legged costume ideas post that goes around every year where he comes up with like flamingo costumes and gingerbread boy with a leg bitten off costumes and things like that. He is also a motivational speaker in addition to having this kind of YouTube comedy channel. And I'm not a big fan of motivational speaking, so I wasn't sure if this was going to lean towards the humor bit or the motivational bit, so I was cautious. And the answer is it's kind of neither. This is mostly a series of stories about girls that he semi-pursued romantic relationships with between the ages of about 13 and 25. And the early stories are fairly charming, fairly cute, fairly funny, because he starts out as a homeschooled child who is misreading a lot of social cues. So that leads to some funny misunderstandings. And when he goes to a public high school, there's some typical high school misunderstandings, which reminded me a little bit of, I have a friend who I regularly pester for stories because her high school stories always seem to me like the uh, American movie comedies of the 1990s. And I mean, he's a little bit younger than that, but they reminded me of her stories in a little bit, so I was enjoying that. But as he gets older and as he's talking about relationships in his 20s, and even in his late teens, it stops being funny and charming and it just becomes creepy. and. He comes off as rather entitled and 
whiny and it's and he talks about how successful he is at stalking and it's a bit of a ha-ha but it's it's creepy the first third i thought was quite charming but as it went on i just went oh no no don't do that and what was funny was there were some potential moments where i think there could have been a lot of humor to it and it just doesn't play to that um there's one moment where he's sort of dating a woman who is in the miss america pageant and there could be some humor to Here's a woman who was 53rd in the Miss America pageant, and he was just 34th in the Paralympics. And there could have been humor from that, but it really wasn't. There were a lot of missed opportunities, missed opportunities in that. Um, so, yeah. And at one point, he ties in all of his losses to, I thought they were judging me, but I was judging myself, which sounded like a motivational speaking chapter. So that kind of turned me off. So, uh yeah funny first third but not so great in the rest i think he was 34th in the turin paralympics which was i think the first year they merged all the categories which was an interesting year i think that was when gerd schoenfelder was winning all the golds i always liked him anyway <laughs> that doesn't matter um so yeah, that's a book. I guess if you were a big fan of his motivational stuff, you might enjoy that because I think it's more similar to that in tone than it is to some of the humor stuff that I had seen, although I don't really follow his YouTube channel either. So I don't, it wasn't my thing. So after that, I picked up a graphic novel and that is Shooting War by Anthony Lappy and drawn by Dan Goldman. This sells itself as being a political satire. It's set in a kind of alternative universe, 2009, where the US president is John McCain rather than Barack Obama. And it's kind of playing on the idea of social media celebrity. There is someone who becomes a war reporter after he was live blogging a terrorist attack in New York City. And I think there are some interesting places that this could have gone with that. But instead, it really read to me as a lot of kind of unfortunate stereotypes. A lot of it is unfortunate stereotyping. There is, for example, a big point where they're talking about, well, this is where these Arab peacekeepers were attacked. And I thought, you would never hear that. They would have a nationality. You know, and I just thought that was outrageous because it kept coming up. It's like, well, he was one of the Arab peacekeepers. Like, no, tell me what country they're from. Nobody says that. There's another point where they think somebody is Iranian and they're, they go, no, this is obviously a French Algerian. He doesn't look Persian at all. I just thought, come on, that can't be a major plot point. Because I mean, that that's certainly something that people say because everyone has a stereotype notion of what any ethnicity or nationality looks like. But as soon as that becomes a point where we're supposed to take that seriously, I can't take that seriously. The art style tries to do something interesting. It uses some combinations of drawing on top of photographs which I thought was really interesting. It uses a lot of framing in the style of television news where you get the scroll along the bottom. So some of that was creative, but I didn't find the style to be fantastic. I did think the art was better than the writing, but as far as satire goes, I think it was cheap satire. It didn't go very deep. And I think some of it, given changes that have happened in the world, this was written in 2007, feels even more unfortunate and plays into stereotypes that seem even more unfortunate now than they did back then. It didn't do, it wasn't biting. It was cheap, I would say. And finally, last night I read Brian Fee's Mom's Cancer, which sounds like it's a kid's book about dealing with the disease in the family, but it is actually a collection of a webcomic strip that the author was producing as his way of dealing with the situation when his mother was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, which had already metastasized. And he had one sister who was living with his mother and one of his sisters was a nurse. And he makes the point that he's sort of the least useful of his siblings in terms of this situation and dealing with things. So this book is what came out of that. This was quite moving and it deals with some quite uh, serious issues in an interesting way. It's never flippant about it, but it's also not weighed down with seriousness or sentimentality. Because it's a memoir, the ending is not necessarily satisfying in the way that a more scripted story would be. But at the same time, it's very, 
it's very compelling to go along on this journey with him. I wouldn't say that this was as good as, say, Roz Chast's Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant, which I think is the gold standard for um, aging parent disease graphic memoirs, <laughs> which I don't think is really a subgenre, but if it were, that would be the gold standard. But this was still quite good and quite short, so um, definitely, I think, worth reading if you are curious about that kind of family experience. All right, that was my week. I hope you've had a good reading week, and that's it for now. Ciao!